I don't want no oil, no spoil in my shoreline. I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things a creeping and crawling. Won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No nukes! Good morning, Toledo. This is Joe DeMar, and welcome. Welcome to For a Green Future. Uh, this is a program where we talk about the ecology and environment, and we talk about things that affect you personally, your family, your pocketbook, your health, because that's ultimately what the environment does. I mean, we think we're in these little bubbles, these little houses where we can wall off the, the world, but no, you're part of the environment, and the environment in turn, it is part of you because this is the planet that we're living on. And so we're going to have a very good show today. We have a, a guest coming in at 8.15. He's uh, Tim Judson. He's from the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, which is a an organization out of Washington, D.C. that uh, watchdogs the nuclear industry. And he's going to talk to us all about this proposed bailout for Davis Bessey and Perry Nuclear Plants. Um, then of course, the bottom of the hour, we're going to hear from our terrific sponsors. So don't worry, no commercials until at least 8.30. Uh, and we're going to hear from you, hopefully, uh, at 866-240-1065. That's 866-240-1065. Please call in and ask uh, your questions about the ecology, about the environment, about any topic relating to that, to those issues. We're all, we end of we have our uh, letter from the future coming up after the bottom of the hour. My great great granddaughter Marie I keeps keeps sending me these letters from twenty two ninety nine. It's kind of amazing. There's this flash of photons next to my bed in the morning, and poof, there's a letter from the future. So, which I'm going to share with you. And uh, but don't worry, you know, if you're someone who listens to this station regularly, right at nine o'clock, sports will be back. Uh, Mick Gonzalez and the cheap seats will be back to with a really great sports talk show. Uh, but just for one hour, we're asking you to, to think about something a little different. We're asking you to think about the world around you and, and you know, not just on the playing field, but the, the fields and the forests and the oceans beyond the playing fields. It's just for an hour or so once a week. Let's open up our minds here. And uh, I want to thank uh, WGRN out of Columbus because uh, starting with the last show, this program is rebroadcast on WGRN. So it's going to be heard by a lot of people in the Columbus area. So Toledoans, if you call in at 866-240-1065, your, your voice will be heard in Columbus by, you know, thousands and thousands of people because that's a, a big station and a big market. It's a, it's a nonprofit station, <clears throat> which means that there's some limitations on what I could say on this show if I want it to be rebroadcast on that show. Uh, so, for example, I, I, can't, uh, I can't do a call to action. I can't actually ask you to do something uh, during this portion of the show or during the portion of the show that gets rebroadcast on WGRN because that violates nonprofit rules, um, which is kind of crazy because things need to be done. And, and don't worry, I will be asking 
you to do things, but I'm going to do it. What I do is I, I pluck out the commercial section of this program. I have commercials at the bottom of the hour. Uh, that's what I'll, I'll pl- I pluck those out before the program goes to WGRN because there can't be commercials on that nonprofit station. But um, yeah, it's, we're very happy that our this show is is catching on. People are listening to it, and they really, really wanted our program because we cover environmental issues. We cover things that that nobody else covers. We talk about issues and give you information that you're not going to hear anywhere else. And um, as I was driving in this morning, you know, it was a, that beautiful pre-dawn light just before the sun comes up, and it was you know, orange on the horizon, and then it, you know, goes from orange to yellow to up to lighter colors up on the top. It's kind of a mini rainbow across the horizon. And uh, I drive in from Bowling Green, so I was coming up north. I look over to the east to look at this beautiful sunrise. And there, right in the smack dab in the middle of it, <clears throat> was this big black, well, it was dark gray, this big dark gray, ugly plume. And uh, it's the plume that's coming from the cooling tower at Davis Bessie. And sometimes people wonder, you know, why do we do this? Why do environmentalists care about this stuff so much? Why do we put so much time and, and energy into it? Why would people do something like put themselves in front of a pipeline that's being built and getting and getting arrested and all the, the pain and suffering and, and expense that comes with that kind of action. And for me, when I look over at Davis Bessie and I see that plume, and I know that right this moment there are radioactive isotopes, there's radio, radioactive pollution being created in the center of that nuclear power plant, that is going to be around for hundreds of thousands of years, poisoning our descendants, causing them cancers, mutations, and other illnesses. And it's all happening for just for that one moment's worth of electricity. It's, to me, I simply can't accept that. You know, I can't allow that to continue. I have to do whatever I can do to stop it. And I think that's what drives a lot of environmentalists that the people who want to weaken environmental laws, the people who want to give you pollution and uh, expose your family and you to, to poisons and, and to degrade your environment so that there's no fish in the river because so they can make some money. They, they always accuse environmentalists of being in it for the money. And I have to tell you that is one of the most ridiculous things. That's one of the, the most almost hilarious lies about the environmental movement about environmentalists that that there is i mean there there's a few organizations out there a few really big ones that have lots of fundraising and and you know maybe their position on this issue or that issue might get turned uh from a big donor like bill gates who's tossing his billions around trying to get us to accept nuclear power there might be one or two organizations that can fit that description sometimes, but most environmentalists are operating on a shoestring budget. Most of us are putting more, we're sacrificing more to to fight these environmental battles than we're getting back out. Trust me on that. And all of them, all of us, every environmentalist that I know is doing work and is doing are doing things and have skills that they're applying that they're getting a fraction literally a fraction of the money that they would be earning in private industry to be doing these things because it's the right thing to do i think that's ultimately why all of us why people are pushing for these environmental issues because they need to happen and so you really can't put a price on it and so when you hear somebody saying, oh, the, the, you know, they're just in that for the money. Um, who did I just hear? Oh, one of the, the fella who owns the company that makes the uh, brine that has the radioactive pollution in it that they want to spray on the, all the roads in Ohio. He 
made that art. He, I heard in a statement, he said, oh, they're just trying to stop this because they want to make money. Well, first of all, the reason he wants to do it is to make money. So if that's his criticism, then uh, he should look to himself because obviously he's only doing this to make money. But the basic accusation is false. Environmentalists are not in it for the money. I can't believe some of the sacrifices I've seen over the decades that people have made uh, in order to keep fighting these battles, in order to prevent uh, things from happening that would hurt their children and, and future generations. So you're going to be hearing from somebody from the Nuclear Information Resource Service. And, uh, you know, for me, that organization is an example of this because they're supported by donations, but they're doing work they're they're keeping at bay and and sometimes they're beating often actually they beat these corporations that are that are putting in millions and tens of millions of dollars to fight them because they're right because they're they're they've got the law on their side and they're and you know what they're doing is is right and what the corporations are trying to do is wrong and you know the people at that organization have been going for for years and i think that it's just it's just amazing. I'm in I'm in awe of the people at at Nears, and so I'm very uh, pleased that we're going to be talking with Tim in just a couple minutes when we open up the phone lines too at eight fifteen. So um, you'll be able to talk to to you know an honest to goodness environmentalist at you know if you call in at eight fifteen at eight six six two four zero one zero six five, and you can ask him questions and you can see for yourself that you know. This is not a person who's in it for the money. Believe me, if, if money were the driving force here, there's a lot more profitable things to do than to try to protect, um, to try to bring into existence this green future. Not that there isn't profit in it, though. Um, a few weeks back, we had a guest on, Leitra Harper, and she has is working her house towards being a carbon negative house. That is, she's putting on solar panels. Uh, she's going to get her heating from geothermal heat, which takes the heat out of the ground around your house, and it doesn't burn anything. It doesn't use natural gas. And so she's doing it for environmental reasons, but her system is going to pay for itself because of reduced natural gas and electric bills in about five years. And then for the, the 50 or so years after that, her system is going to, give her profit. She's going to earn money off of the system. And it was only hooked up for a couple days. And I went over to her house and, and looked at it. It's really cool. Uh, it looks 21st century. It's got those Tesla batteries. And uh, I looked at her meter and her system had already put more power into the grid than her house had used since the plant panels were hooked up. So there's profit to be made. And ultimately, once we get to the green future, once we get to a sustainable future, we're all going to be richer. You know, that is a point I want to stress on this program. The green future is a prosperous future because we won't be paying big medical bills. We won't be um, having to heat, pay money to the, the heating companies and the, and the electric companies. They'll be paying us money because we'll be generating electricity and and uh, we'll be heating our own homes by taking the heat out of the ground around our houses. We will have more money to spend. You'll have more money to spend. You'll be healthier. Um, but that's not the reason. But money is not the driving force behind the environmental movement. Uh, trust me. So um, I think, but speaking of money, right now what's being proposed in Columbus is a bailout for First Energy. Now, First Energy is a company, an electric company, that um, has gone all in on nuclear. They, they, We had a relicensing hearing on the davis Bessey nuclear power plant a few years back, and a bunch of us got together and we held what was, we called it the people's hearing on davis Bessey because the, the public hearings that had been scheduled were all at times and places where it was pretty much impossible for most people to attend. So we had a people's hearing at, at our own time in, in here in Toledo, and we had experts come in, and they laid out for First Energy. They, they said 
look, if you switch to wind and you switch to solar, it's going to be cheaper for you to generate power than it is with Davis Bessie. You're going to employ more people with good paying jobs. And in the long run, it will be more profitable for your co corporation. And Dave and first energy was like, eh, no, no, we, we love nuclear. We're going to go with nuclear no matter what they got their relicensing and they got their to keep running their nuke plant. But the problem is we were right. And Davis at first energy is going bankrupt because the power from Davis Bessie is too expensive. And so what they did is they announced, oh, well, we're going to close Davis Bessie. But they lied <laughs> because what they had in mind the whole time was to get a bailout from the state government, which means you and me. Now, the details of this bailout haven't been released yet. They could be increased fees, which would come through the Public Utility Commission. So your electric bill would quadruple or triple or quintuple, who knows. Or it could be directly from the state, which would mean that your taxes would have to go up to pay First Energy to keep running an expensive plant, which is falling apart. So here, today's issue, we're going to be on the trying to protect your pocketbook uh, on for a green future. And so with me today, we have Tim Judson, who I believe your official title is Executive Director at the Nuclear Information Resource Center. Hi, Tim. Are you with us? And did I get your title right? I am. I am. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So, so Tim, um, yeah, these bailouts have happened uh, around the country. So this is a, a very, this is a practiced strategy. First Energy didn't come up with this idea of pretending to plan to shut down the plant and then creating this false political pressure to get bailed out by the state. This has happened in other places, hasn't it? Uh, it has, although First Energy really has been, uh, you know, a pioneer in this in, in this particular kind of business model, if you want to call it that. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, other other big nuclear utilities uh, like Exelon, which operates in several states, and uh, PSE and G, which operates in New Jersey, um, have have also been uh, been been using this gambit to. Uh, to secure, you know, billions of dollars in, in bailouts from uh, from ratepayers. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just get an idea of, of, of the scope of this. You know, when you say billions, are we talking tens of billions, single billions? Is it sort of open-ended? Can they just keep going billions and billions into the future? Uh, how much money are these corporations getting by getting bailed out? Sure. Well, it varies a bit from state to state. Um, you know, these are, you know, these, these these uh, these subsidies have been kind of cooked up on an ad hoc basis, um, based on essentially whatever uh, you know, whatever uh, that the the utility companies can leverage politically through 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 the influence that they have. In New York, there's four reactors that are being subsidized to the tune of about seven and a half billion dollars over twelve years. Um, in Illinois, uh, there's a, a two and a half billion dollar bailout, roughly, for three reactors there. Uh, New Jersey, there are three reactors that are um, likely to be subsidized um, for about three billion dollars over the next, um, or three and a half billion dollars over the next twelve years or so. Um, so it's, it varies quite a bit from state to state, but in, it, it is generally in the billions, and that's what's expected with uh, with the proposal that First Energy is going to put forward in Ohio. Yeah, so billions and billions, as, as Carl Sagan used to say. And the ironic thing about this, of course, is that just a few years ago. The utilities were all talking about how about deregulation, about how you know if we can just let things compete, you know then we'll get the cheapest form of generation and people's electric bills will go down. At that time, they they didn't realize that wind and solar would become so inexpensive compared to nuclear, and you know in a deregulated competitive com deregulated competitive market, nuclear plants would have shut down. All of them would have shut down a couple years ago. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know about all of them. I mean, there's, you know, the, the the things that are happening in the nuclear industry are pretty uneven, actually. I mean, you have a lot of you have a lot of nuclear plants in the country which are very profitable, including these ones in New Jersey and Connecticut that are receiving billion or going to receive billions of dollars in subsidies. Um, the utility companies that own those reactors have admitted that that these that these reactors are actually still really profitable. 
Um, but what they're saying is that they just aren't profitable enough for them to continue operating them. And that's where they come in with these threats to close them. Um, and likewise, with First Energy, not all of its reactors are considered unprofitable. I mean, the ones in Ohio, um, you know, pretty much demonstrably are unprofitable at this point. But uh, First Energy is also planning to close um, its, uh, its uh, Beaver Valley nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania, which the, which the, you know, which the regional grid operator uh, believes actually is still profitable. Um, so this is really, you know, about trying to get um, subsidies to keep uneconomical plants um, and even economical plants um, more profitable. Um, but it's not really an issue of um, trying to save the environment like First Energy makes it out to be. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hear that argument that, you know, keeping the nuke plants going is good for the environment. But, but nuclear doesn't, isn't purely... Uh, benign when it comes to global warming is it i mean nuclear no i mean no i mean you're i mean you're correct i mean you know on on a, on a number in a num, on a number of different levels um i mean nuclear has a pretty big carbon footprint itself um you know because you know just just providing the uranium to fuel these reactors is a really carbon intensive energy intensive process um that you know that produces more greenhouse gases than um than any other kind of non fossil fuel power you can get um, but also, you know, when you think about the life cycle of these plants, you know, the amount of energy that went into building them, um, and then when, and the amount of energy it's going to take to decommission them and tear them apart um, and ship the waste across the country um, is also very energy intensive. And so, um, you know, with these old plants, you know, like the ones we're talking about, you've got sort of, you know, those things are sort of baked into the decision to build them in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have these plants that are that are both creating nuclear pollution uh, radioactive pollution and they're contributing to the, the greenhouse effect and they're um, you know they're they're suppressing the switch to to renew to actually sustainable energy to renewable energy because um, you know they're there uh, pumping out their 800 in Davis Bessie's case 800 megawatts at a time and so it's just a, a bad policy decision altogether. So, what what do you think? What's your impression of the of the Ohio, the proposed Ohio bailout? How how do you think that's going to affect the the average person listening to this show in, in Toledo and Columbus? Uh, well, I mean, it's gonna, it's going to raise it's going to raise their electric rates. It's also it's not just going to raise you know their electric rates at home. It's going to raise the electric rates for all of their employers. It's going to raise their the electric rates for for their local governments and for their school districts and for the hospitals that we use and you know in, in every in every sector of you know of our lives energy costs are going to go up with these with these bailouts and what we're seeing in places like New York where these where these things are already in effect is that there's you know, there's employers like hospitals and you know manufacturers that are seeing their you know their their utility costs go up by over a million dollars a year Shoot. and yeah and and so what we're talking about is potentially you know, jobs being lost in other parts of the economy um, as employers struggle to, you know, to, to, to make their utility costs. Um, you know, and, and when you think about it in terms of, you know, schools and local government services and those sort of things, um, you know, that's, that's either taxes going up or, you know, or jobs being cut or services being cut. Oh, that is a good point. If, if the electric bill goes up on your local school district, your local school district is going to come back to you to ask for more taxes in order to pay their electric bill. So it, or lay off teachers, you know, increase class sizes, not buy new school books. I mean, this is these are these are serious implications. Yeah. Well, plus the the, you know, the claim is that there's about seventeen hundred people employed at Davis Bessie, and I think that number's kind of inflated. But let's give it to them for the moment. But there's over three thousand people. We have a, a plant here in Perrysburg, Ohio, uh, First Solar. There's over three thousand people employed at, at First Solar. And so the nuclear is asking for these unfair subsidies to compete with a, other energy sources that employ more people and don't produce the, the radiation and don't produce the greenhouse gas problems that nuclear does. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, this is, this is a choice about what kind of an economy we're going to have going forward. And, you know, at First Energy and the other nuclear utilities get a lot of political traction you know, out of the relatively large workforces that work at nuclear power plants. It's nowhere near 1,700 at Davis-Bessey, by the way. I mean, 
if they're, you know, I'd be very surprised if the, if the uh, permanent workforce, the full-time workforce at the plant was more than 700. Um, they do, they do hire a lot of people on, you know, a lot of building trades on contract work and, um, you know, for maintenance projects and those sort of things, which, uh, which, you know, which raises the total number of people employed by the plant um, a bit more, but, um, but it's nowhere near, you know, 1,700 full-time positions at the plant. Um, and as you point out, um, you know, energy, you know, energy efficiency and renewable energy jobs are, you know, uh, are, are much more job intensive in terms of the amount of employment that comes out of every dollar you spend on them. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I, this past week, I was researching this a little bit, and I, I found these allegations that um, First Energy has, in the Republican primaries in 2018, made direct contributions to a batch of uh, Ohio House and, and uh, representatives and state senators. And so, you know, essentially it looks like, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating this. I, I saw it reported, but I haven't uh, looked at the finance reports, my, the campaign finance reports myself, but it looks like that they just essentially in the last election went out and bought themselves a batch of House of, Repre- of U.S. representatives and, and state senators and, so there's a the push that's going through Columbus right now is coming from that uh, group, especially the new House of Rep- leader of the House of Representatives, um, who just took over the House this past uh, election cycle. And so this 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 company, First Energy, is not only distorting our energy policy and our and the economics of Ohio; they're also distorting our our political processes. Um, so it's it's basically unforgivable, but uh, I want to open up the phone lines. I want to be sure to remind everybody that they have a chance here to talk with Tim Judson, head of of Nuclear Information Resource Service or NIRS. So give us a call, please, at eight six six two four zero one zero six five. That's eight six six two four zero one zero six five. Are you somebody who works at First Solar? What do you think about this idea that? that one of the competitors for the electricity that you're producing is going to get from you. They're going to take from your paycheck and your, and your uh, state taxes. They're going to force you to subsidize your competitor. They're going to force you to subsidize a nuclear plant. Um, how does that sit with you? Is that, is that something you're just willing to do? Do you, do you like the way that plume of, of cooling water comes out that comes out from uh, Davis Bessie? Um, is that so, you know, what do you think? 866-240-1065. Um, another point I wanted to make is that nuclear power plants are have other environmental impacts, too. I mean, the cooling tower at davis Bessey, as I recall, kills about 3,000 birds a year. Um, can you talk a little bit about the sort of the ancillary problems with, with nuclear power plants and what, sort of, what other sorts of environmental damage they do? Sure. Yeah, this is a really good point, Joe, because, you know, there's a lot, I mean, in, you know, in trying to get these bailouts um, for these for these old reactors, uh, you know, they're, the industry is really overselling, um, you know, its, you know, its environmental impact. And, you know, they're, they're labeling nuclear clean, they're labeling it zero emissions. You know, the thing you got to realize about nuclear power is that, you know, while you're not burning, you know, you're not burning a lot of, you know, petroleum or coal at, at, at the power plant site to generate electricity, Nuclear has massive environmental impact. You know, I mean, from, from you know, from from mining uranium, which generates you know thousands of pounds of radioactive waste for every pound of fuel that goes into the reactor, um, you know, to the releases of radioactive waste uh, that happen after the reactor site during the operations, and then you're ended, up, and then you end up at the end with a pile of radioactive rubble and steel. Uh, when you decommission these things, it has to be disposed of, just disposed of somewhere. Plus. Um, intensely radioactive nuclear fuel um, that uh, that for which there's still no solution, um, and it's going to remain hazardous to the environment for hundreds of thousands of years. <laughs> yeah, I I have uh, Brandon is on the line, and uh, I'll get to Brandon in just a second. But really quickly, I'm going to tell a story. On my 18th birthday, I uh, went to a symposium on nuclear power, and it was supposed to be a debate between uh, someone from the industry and someone opposed to nuclear power. And I'll never forget, at the start of that debate, the nuclear uh, representative got up there and said, well, we now have a solution to the nuclear waste problem. 
And the, the anti-nuclear guy said, well, well, what is it? And he said, I can't tell you right now. It's, it's secret. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was when I was 18, and now I'm 56. So it's pretty clear that guy was just lying. They don't have a solution to nuclear waste. They've never had one. And there's a lot of lying done by the nuclear industry. But let's hope we hear some, some truth from Brandon. Brandon, you are on the line. Thanks for calling for a green future. Thank you. Yes, Brandon, um, go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, I, my my question is, is is I'm both a supporter and a detractor of nuclear power, but where's our energy going to come from in the future for our kids, our grandkids, and their kids, and so on? Well, well, Tim, do you want to feel that, and then I'll jump in. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's really, uh, you know, no doubt that we're going to have, that we have plenty of energy available, energy resources available for the future. Um, you know, and I think most importantly from renewable energy, um, I think that, you know, in states like Ohio, they've, you know, I mean, first energy has, um, enacted laws and legislation that make it as hard as possible to build renewable energy. Um, but that's not to say that, that, that there's, that there's not sufficient renewable energy resources in Ohio. Um, and, you know, you see, if you look just in other states, um, you know, where renewable energy is really taking off, um, they're building renewable energy much faster than nuclear power has ever grown. Um, I mean, for instance, in Texas, um, and, you know, in, in three years, um, they put up enough wind, uh, enough new wind power in Texas, um, to equal the amount of nuclear power that's being bailed out in New York. And it took, it took 20 years to build those reactors in New York. It only took three years to build the, to build the same amount of wind in Texas. And you're seeing that same sort of thing happening in, in, in other states as well. So I think, you know, what's, what's necessary is for, uh, you know, for, for state governments and local governments and the federal government um, to recognize where our energy future is and to put the policies in place that are going to let us move in that direction yeah. as quickly as possible. Yeah, Brandon, I, I think the short answer is just the, is wind and sun. I mean, you sound old enough to remember the uh, the oil embargo. Am I am I correct? Am I getting too personal here? No, you're fine. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Back in Carter's day, that you know, he told the Defense Department, okay, well, what happens if this oil embargo is permanent? You know, how can we keep the country running? And the Defense Department came back and said, well, there's more than enough wind just in the continental United States. That alone could supply all the energy that that the country needs to keep going. So so there's plenty of wind and plenty of sun, and our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, it, wind and sun will still be there. So we'll, so they can get continue to get all the energy they need from those sources. Well, I'm, I, I, bl- I believe all that, but uh-huh. we have, we have not, still not solved the problem of how to store the energy. Well, I mean, wind and sun are primarily energy sources that only happen during the daylight hours. Well, I'll tell you, we are, actually, we're just about there. It's solving that problem. That is an engineering problem, and, and, you know, once Americans commit to doing it, we're amazing at solving engineering problems. And my friend, uh, Leitra Harper, who just got her system running up in, uh, uh, she lives in Bowling Green, and she's got a solar system, and she's got two Tesla batteries. They're you know, these big lithium ion, lithium ion batteries. And those two batteries are absorb enough energy from her panels during the day to power her house at night. And so she net has not only been able to supply all the power her house needs from the solar, but she's also putting more power back into the grid. She's actually powering her neighbor's houses just with solar panels that are just on the south facing roof of her house. And so we, if we have a distributed network, that is, if, you know, if, if people all over have these battery backups, um, that will carry over during the, the lulls when there's no wind and there's no sun. And, you know, the, so that problem, that problem is, we're, we're just about there. Would you, would you agree with that assessment, Tim? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true, Joe. I mean, you know, what you got to realize is that, um, you know, we've been running an electricity system in this country with basically the same engineering, co- engineering design for 100 years. Um, 
And you know, there's and there's, there's actually been a tremendous tremendous lack of innovation in the in, you know in, in the utility sector about how to provide electricity reliably and efficiently and cost effectively. Um, you know, but as these new technologies you know are coming online, you know, wind, solar, uh, you know, battery storage, um, lots of electron like lots of digital controls and and technologies. Um, there's a tremendous amount of innovation happening, and a lot of a lot of these old assumptions about how we're going to provide, you know, 24-7 electricity service um, are going out the window. And you see, even in places of the country like the Midwest, um, you know, where, you know, um, you know, where wind is growing really rapidly, um, the companies that, that run the electricity system keep on revising their estimates upward about how much renewable energy they could, you know, they, they could handle on the grid as it's currently built. And so now, you know, the, um, uh, the Southeast Power Pool, which runs the grid across several states, says that it can handle 70% wind um, and, and run the electricity system reliably, even though wind is, you know, is, is as we all know, an intermittent source of energy. And the thing you got the thing you got to also realize about different renewable energy sources is that they actually match up better than some people think. For instance, you know, with onshore wind, um, you know, it actually predominantly generates at night, and solar predominantly generates, as we know, during the day. And so, and so these, they, actually, they, actually match, they, they actually can match up fairly well in terms of thinking about providing a consistent electricity supply without having to invest in you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars in energy storage. Yeah, so it, I guess the fancy word is, is negative correlation. So when the sun is shining, or when the, when the wind is dead, the sun is usually shining. And when, the, when it's windy, it may not be sunny. But if you've got both wind and sun, you get power most of the time, almost all the time. So, all right. Well, Brandon, did we, did we answer your question? Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, obviously I live in the Northwest Ohio Toledo area now, but I come from North central Ohio and they've been trying to put some wind farms there. And I'm telling you that the, the farmers, the families that live out there, they, they just don't want that in their, their backyard. Well, there's been a lot of uh, disinformation spread about wind power, and that's one of the reasons I'm I'm doing this show is because there've been, you know, there's there's a a concerted effort to convince people that turbines are dangerous, that they that they explode, that they give off uh, you know invisible rays that somehow you know hurt people around them. You know, it, these things aren't true, and I think if you go to most parts of the of the country. Um, especially the farmers are, are are very much in favor of wind because uh, if you've got a wind turbine on your farm, it only needs a forty foot by forty foot uh, footprint, even for a you know a hundred foot tower, and you can farm literally right up to the base of the tower. You can grow corn right up to the base of it, and it's a reliable source of income. You know you you will get so much money per year from your wind turbine as it's generating electricity. And so, so places, farmers are actually some of the most, um, you know, the strongest proponents of, of wind power in a lot of places in the country. And so, you know, Ohio and Michigan, you know, there's a concerted effort to, to try to mislead farmers away from a, a source of revenue that might literally save their farm. Because, you know, even on the off years when your crops are bad, you're still going to have wind. So, um, yeah, so that's that's a matter of education, and uh, that's what we're trying to do here on For a Green Future. So uh, thanks very much, Brandon, for your call. All right, thank you. Okay. Yeah, and Brandon touched on something, and you touched on it before, that I, I want to remind our listeners about, especially our, our new listeners down in Columbus. 2014, uh, there was a law passed that essentially outlawed wind farms in uh, the state of Ohio. It, it said that you have to have at least a quarter mile setback from your property line to the next owner's property line for a wind turbine. And that means you have to own at least a half a mile square of property. And if you do, if you do own that much land, you can only put one turbine right in the center of your property. And so this law, which I guess I'm hearing that First Energy had something to do with this law going into place, uh, there were all there were a lot of wind farms planned in the state of Ohio. You know, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in terms of jobs, 
and uh, revenue that could be coming from those turbines right now into the state. And instead, uh, it killed wind farms in, in Ohio. There haven't been any significant wind farms built since that law in 2014. And one of the things that the Republicans are are hinting at, they're hinting at a, a grand bargain for this uh for this uh, this bailout money, or, or a grand screw-over, as I call it. They're saying, oh, well, we will repeal that 2014 laws if you just give us billions of dollars to bail out Davis Bessie. And, uh, you know, to me, that's, that's unacceptable. I, we should not have to take the poison in order to get the medicine. Uh, it, so, well, anyway, that's, that's my opinion, and I'm sticking by it. So, Tim... Uh, thanks very much for being with us. Uh, this is a commercial station, so and we've only got one hour, I'm afraid. So uh, we've got to be moving on. But it's been wonderful. I, you know, I really appreciate the work you guys at Nears do. And if so, if people want more information about Nears, how would they find out about it? Uh, you can uh, well, you can find us on the web really easily. It's www.nirs.org. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tim Judson, and and thank you, Brandon. That was an excellent call. And uh, because this is a commercial station, we're going to be moving on, and we've got to talk about our wonderful sponsors. So the the, the program's going to drop out for you folks in Columbus for a little bit, but don't worry, it'll be back soon. So uh, thanks again, Tim, and have a great day. Thank you, Joe. Bye. All right. So For a Green Future is brought to you by uh, one of our sponsors is the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature, restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. The Wood County Parks protects 20 parks and nature preserves all around Wood County, and all those parks and preserves are open from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. So we have some stuff coming up. Uh, that they'd like you to know about. One is this Friday, March 22nd, uh, there's going to have a program called Wildflowers and Wildside Beer and Trivia. That's at the WW Night Preserve. Uh, you can register at wcparks.org. And uh, they're, they're going to have a, a vintner there, a, a fellow who brews beers. He's going to talk about the, the process, the microorganisms and so forth, and how to make beer. And we're going to drink beer. And as we're drinking it, we're going to try to answer trivia questions, which should be uh, pretty interesting. Uh, my wife and I are going to this. We've, we've already signed up and reserved. It looks like a lot of fun. So uh, if you wanted to meet me in person, you'd be, you know, here's a chance. Let's see. So uh, also the next day, Saturday, March 23rd, there's going to be a woody plant removal at the Sawyer Quarry Nature Preserve. That's at 26940 Lime City Road in Perrysburg. They're going to be in there removing um, invasive species, woody plants, and recreating a more natural habitat. So if you want to help in that, if you want to get your hands dirty, roll up your sleeves, and uh, you can register at wcparks.galaxydigital.com. There's also going to be a conservation volunteer day at Otsego Park. That's April 16th. And again, you'd... Uh, for volunteering, you, you sign up at wcparks.galaxydigital.com. And uh, Sunday 28th is the Community Earth Day celebration that's going to happen in Bowling Green at the Montessori uh, School on 515 Sandwich Road. You don't have to register. Just come and have some fun. Uh, learn how to be go green, and you can find lots of resources on how to do that. That's April 28th from 2 to 4 p.m. And uh, finally, on May 11th is the Wood County Park District's annual plant sale. And you can buy native plants there that they've grown in their own greenhouses. You don't need to register, uh, just show up, but you can pre-order annuals if you'd like to at the wcparks.org slash friends. So so if you want more information, you just go to wcparks.org. They're also on Facebook at Wood County Park District. They're on Twitter at Wood Park Dist. Instagram, also Wood Park Dist, and again, volunteer, wcparks.galaxydigital.com. Our other sponsor for this hour is uh, DeMar Consulting. DeMar Consulting is a computer consulting business. They will help you with your computer problems. The difference is that they come to your home. 
So, you know, you no need to disconnect your computer and put it in the car and take it somewhere. Uh, DeMar Consulting will come right out. They will help back up your computer. They'll help you if you've got virus problems. They'll help you if you need to figure out some piece of software that you bought and you just don't know how to get it going. Um, they'll back up your data for you. Pretty much any kind of computer problem that you have, you should call DeMar Consulting and have them come out and take a look at it. Their, their rates are very reasonable, and uh, they can be found at demarconsulting.com. And DeMar is spelled D-E-M-A-R-E, -E. so it's demarconsulting.com. No spaces or dashes or anything. You can also reach them by phone or by text at 419-973-3000. That's 419-973-3000. So, um, yeah, give DeMar Consulting a call today. And uh, this is the part of the show where I can make a call to action. I can't do it for the parts that are going to be in the, uh, the nonprofit broadcast. So I would say call your representative, call your call the governor, call your state senator, and uh, tell them no bailout for First Energy. Uh, this is just a bad deal for you. It's a bad deal for your family. It's a bad deal for the state of Ohio. So, so do that today. I, I already did that. My representative, my state senator in uh, BG is Teresa Gavarone. Uh, so I called her office and left a message. Uh, her her voicemail says that she promises someone will get right back to me. I I'm still waiting for that to happen, but um, I don't have a, a representative. Those of us in in the district in Bowling Green, Teresa Gavarone was our representative. They appointed her to state senate, and now there's nobody in that seat. So I, I called Gavarone, I called the governor, and I'm urging you to do that too. So um, I'm also urging you to call in at 866-240-1065. We still have a, a bit of time. We could take another call or two. Uh, Brandon had an excellent call. We're very happy he called in. Um, and But don't worry if the, the cheap seats with Mick, Mick Gonzalez is on the way. So sports will be back in, in you know just a few minutes here. But before we get back to sports, I wanted to talk a little bit. There was a, a, a minor victory for um, environmentalists this week, which you probably didn't hear about on the news. In South Dakota, they're fighting the, the Keystone XL pipeline. You probably remember this pipeline. It was being uh, fought over all through the Obama administration. Um, there were people being arrested. This is a pipeline which is supposed to bring tar sands from Canada all the way through the United States down into Texas where they would be exported and uh, go off to places like China and, and other countries. So literally, they're, you know, this Canadian company is just trying to walk all over the U.S. It's, it's just looking at us as the entire continent, of, you know, the entire country of the United States. They're just looking at us as sort of an obstacle they have to plow over and plow through in order to, to get their tar sands off to other places in the world and to make their money. Well, the pipeline uh, has been stopped in court because... As you recall, you may recall, uh, Obama hemmed and hawed literally for his entire administration. Finally, in the last month or so of his administration, he said, okay, no XL pipeline. And so one of the first things Trump did when he got into office is he said, okay, XL pipeline. And he gave permission for them to go ahead again. But he did it completely ignoring all the environmental laws that the... Um, pipeline would violate and so they took him to court and we there was actually a court victory this past week the ninth u.s circuit court of appeals said no president trump you cannot completely ignore environmental law when you make a, a presidential proclamation you just you can't you know you have to obey the law and uh it's great news you know We'll see if it holds up, if the if Keystone, you know, if the company Trans Canada, if they appeal to the Supreme Court, uh, I'm not too hopeful because a lot of those Supreme Court justices are, uh, let's say, morally questionable. I don't know. The, the latest one, Kavanaugh, I just read Tom Hartman uh, has, has said that 
Kavanaugh, just in the year before he got appointed, he mysteriously had uh, millions of dollars of debt. Somehow he just got the money to pay off all that debt. It's not clear where it came from, you know, who, who gave it to him, what he did, but it looks pretty much, it's according to Tom Hartman, it looks like, you know, Trump's latest Supreme Court appointee was involved in some shady deals and, and took some money maybe he shouldn't have. And uh, if that shocks you, I have to point out that actually most of Trump's associates, you know, are in prison right now for doing that very same thing. I, I it's it's kind of amazing. This is literally one of the most corrupt presidents in U.S. history, simply based on the number of people that have gone to prison, his associates that went to prison because they did corrupt things. And yet, you know, somehow think people think that he's apart from that corruption. Uh, no, I, I think that if you're surrounded by it, if you encourage it, you're a part of it. So anyway, on to, so there's a, a rare victory for the environmental movement. And we do still have time to take one more call, 866-240-1065. That's 866-240-1065. Um, now it's time for our weekly letter from the future. My uh, great-great-granddaughter, Marie I, has uh, sent me another letter from the year 2299. And here it is. And if you, you know, if, if you want to know the complete story of what's happening with, with Marie I, you need to go back and listen to our, our podcasts or, or watch our YouTube videos. Um, we are on... We are on a podcast as uh, you just search for For a Green Future. We also have a, a YouTube channel. And again, you just search for For a Green Future and you can subscribe and listen to all our podcasts. And if you go on the YouTube version, then there's some supplemental material there. We, I put images up along with the interviews so you could see, you'll be able to see what Tim Judson actually looks like. Um, you know, and there'll be uh, contact information for our sponsors. And you you'll, you can see uh, other things, you know, I, besides just hearing my, my voice and your voice. Um, so I'd, I suggest subscribing to the YouTube channel. Anyway, so here is the latest letter from Marie. Greetings from the Kola Peninsula. The days are getting longer very quickly now. This close to the Arctic Circle, the swings between winter and summer are much more radical. The days are getting noticeably longer, racing towards the spring equinox. Still lots of ice and snow, though. The bay is still frozen solid. Sometimes when I'm having problems with the bacteria I'm studying, I'll bundle up and go outside and watch the wind blowing the snow over the frozen bay. The other day I was doing that when Michael came outside and surprised me. He asked me to come inside. There was something he wanted to show me. I told you in an earlier letter that they have been having problems with his part of the project to deal with nuclear waste that you made in your time. The radioactive and chemical wastes were destroying the inside of the reactor chamber where they were being broken down. That's how Michael burned his hand and got that scar on his palm. Well, Michael figured out a solution to the problem. You had primitive 3D printers in your time. Well, in 2299, we have three 3D printers that can print things one molecule at a time. Michael designed a whole new crystalline form of silicon dioxide that's never been seen before. Lining the inside of the reaction chamber with this new crystal protects it from the radiation. He's so quiet, I forget how brilliant he is. Sometimes he just amazes me. Everyone working on the project has been congratulating him, which just seems to make him really uncomfortable. It's cute. Anyway, I wish I had a solution to my problem. Something in our drilling fluid is still killing one of the bacteria in the drill hole. I have to find an uh, approval for it or the whole project will stop. Don't worry, I will find a solution. And don't worry, you'll succeed too. Keep talking to people about the, the green future. It's coming. Love, Marie I. So, a very nice letter from my great, great granddaughter, Marie I. And, you know, it's... We have just enough time for one more caller, and the caller has called in. Carrie, thank you very much for calling in, and welcome to For a Green Future. Carrie, you're on the line. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Hi. Yes. So the, you're talking about the tar sands yes. pipeline. Yes. And I'd like to know, do you, do you have any information about who was the 
um, a pellet, I guess you would call it, uh, for that for that uh, lawsuit because I belong to National Resources Defense Council and I have um, you know a lot of information for them and they take a lot of credit for these lawsuits. Do you know who was who actually brought the suit? No, I, I don't have that information at my my fingertips. I, I I know it was at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and the decision was this past week, so it shouldn't be too hard to look up. But um, I do know that several uh, Native American nations are fighting this in court. So I, I think it may have been the the Sioux tribe may have been one of the the appellates for this uh, for this lawsuit that succeeded. In fact, I'm pretty sure they are, but but uh, I don't know all the all the people in it. Yeah, that would make sense because it's going to come. It was supposed to come down through, I think, the Dakotas, and that's the the Sioux. Um, well, it's all pretty much all um, uh, plain Sioux. So that uh, all right. I was just interested in whether or not Natural Resources Defense Council had any part in that because I give my money to them and I want them to make sure they're doing good things with it. So, <laughs> well, be sure. That's it. Yeah, I, I so. You know, you might want to talk to them about this this bailout too, because I, I know that they're intimately involved in what's going on there in in Columbus. That they've got people working in Columbus, so you might want to give them a call and talk to them about the uh, about this bailout. But yeah, so I'll do I'll do that. All right. Well, thanks for this call, and uh, all right. So that brings us almost. We've just got four minutes left, so we we could have one more caller. Um, Let's see, what else did I want to cover this week? This is kind of unusual because usually I run out of stuff to cover. Uh, a few weeks back, I went and I saw Winona LaDuke. She was at Otterbein University, and uh, that was a very interesting uh, talk she gave. Winona LaDuke was, of course, the Green Party candidate for vice president back in the year 2000. And, uh, oh, I forgot to mention that I... I am the political director for the Ohio Green Party, but on this program I don't talk for the don't speak for the Ohio Green Party. I'm speaking only for myself, as are all my guests and all my and anyone who calls in. None of us are representing anybody else. We're all, we're all just speaking for ourselves. So uh, Wedona talked about this this interesting uh, prophecy that a lot of the Native American tribes are. Are talking about it. It's it's called the. Let me see the the seventh fire prophecy of the seventh or the is it the eighth fire. Mm. But anyway, basically, there's a prophecy that right now our generation is going to be presented with a choice, and that you know there's two paths we can go on. One path is uh, well worn, but it's burned, it's scorched, and the other path is less traveled, but it's green and it's growing, and it's alive. And uh, it was just interesting to hear her talking about, uh, you know, the Native American spirituality aspect of, of the environmental questions that we're facing today. And her tribe is one of the tribes that is fighting these uh, these pipelines. They're fight and it's very interesting that one of the things that these pipelines have done is unite all the Native American tribes in North America because they're all completely opposed to, to all these pipelines and all this fossil fuel infrastructure. And, you know, Native Americans from the, the northernmost parts of Canada all the way down through the continental United States are united in their opposition to these pipelines. And I, I think that most Americans are also opposed to these pipelines. I mean, we're not getting anything out of them. The Nexus pipeline, which was shoved through the state of Ohio, violated the property rights of thousands of people. I mean, we had a fellow just talking about farmers. Pipe, you know, this plowed through millions of acres of farmland, very fertile farmland, and plants just don't grow as well over a pipeline as they do, you know, in undisturbed soils. So so we're costing farmers crops, we're, we're costing them yield, and that costs them profits. And so ultimately, all these bad environmental decisions hurt us it hurt our pocketbooks thank you very much i'm out of time thank you so much for listening to for a green future and we will be back next week i don't want no oil 
A spoil in my shoreline, I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things, a creeping and crawling, won't trade no 